not a con. Is a gaming and simulation lab that together at, at Case about a year ago, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, the chair, Ron Maragani, had an idea had, um, in the and I think his thought at the time was uh, to have a place where students can go and they can play Xboxes, PS2s, and really relax and just just kind of just chill out uh, in, the, in the department. And that was that was yeah. And uh, but when I talked about it, I said I wanted to take it because my interest was largely in the in the simulation area. And um, again, yes, a little bit uh, on my part, but but not certainly an avid gamer. And and if I was uh, heading to anything, really heading off to the right side over there and playing Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, uh, I used to be a, a pilot. And, had a lot of flying hours in, so it was the the uh, more realistic simulations, the races that, if anything, that that I would uh, gravitate toward. And when he mentioned the idea, I said I wanted to run with it, but I really wanted to make it a larger uh, uh, facility that we could really integrate into the curriculum and and excite students not only about playing games, but about developing them and and um, and using them. As, as tools in, in the classroom. So that's the background. And then um, from that point, we found that the, um, within the university, there was a source of funds. Uh, uh, through the Prozo, provost's office, president's office slash provost's office. And uh, put a, pro, a proposal together. Um, I thought fairly, fairly modest. And then um, the engineering dean's office said, bump it up. Let's let Let's go for the uh, the big stuff, and um, the provost office funded uh, the lab to the tune of three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, which is not large compared to the multi-million dollar. Yeah, it's a lot of Xboxes, and if you really start putting together things and just go for hardware and and software, there's a lot that you can you can buy. As you'll see, how we're putting this thing together. Um, as we're, as we're moving along. So we got the money pretty much at the end of, uh, of last year, the allocation. And then it's taken a while to get to the point where we're ready to roll this thing out. And uh, in fact, we're at the point where we met with the architects and the engineers this past week and finalized the plans for the laboratory. And we'll, we'll see what that looks like in just a sec. And then uh, we're going out for the physical construction uh, of the laboratory, uh, maybe another week, another week or so. Um, I think the only thing that remains is where one faceplate has to be, and Froggy needs to determine. <laughs> so, so when he comes back after recovering from the conference, uh, he'll determine where that needs to go, and we'll be ready to roll at that point. Uh, construction will uh, be starting right after graduation at Case, which is. Uh, pretty much mid-May, final completion of construction, early July, and then stocking the lab with everything um, for the rest of the summer. So, so fall of uh, this coming year, we're, we're ready to roll. Now, um, the motivation behind it, uh, there's really several, several points that I think um, are important. Uh, first of all is gaming and the pervasiveness of, of gaming. Um, people have generally been quoting numbers on the order of $10 billion per year, um, although every time I read uh, something, uh, it gets bumped up. So I certainly have heard $12 billion, $15 billion uh, a year, and, um, and, and I think even at that, it's conservative for what the possibilities are going into the future, even a few years. Um, and going further down, uh, down the line, um, if we kind of open up our, our, our thoughts in terms of gaming, it, it can be even incredibly larger. So there's a market for games themselves, obviously, that's huge, and that's gaming alone. Um, simulation, I, I, I'm not even sure how to put a 
price tag on what the simulation industry is. Um, and, 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 and the way I look at it, it kind of blends from high fidelity, serious simulation, um, uh, all the way through to kind of almost game-like simulation uh, through the game, through the gaming. And, and, and even at that, if you look at some of the games today uh, and look at the, the modeling that's going on in some of the, uh, um, particularly uh, maybe the racing games and, and the flight simulators and things like that, that, that's serious modeling that's going on in there, very sophisticated. So there, there is a, a spectrum. The size of the simulation industry, I, I can't begin to get. That's true. That's true. Or, or, or the simulations, for, for, for that matter. Um, uh, it, it was interesting. When, when, I, uh, when I started my career, I was involved in, in simulation. And it was um, uh, simulation of uh, defense uh, systems. Uh, if you will, and we had there was one simulation that was talked about. It was um, um, uh, a simulation of a, of, a, of a bomb blast. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And, and the time to run the simulation was so large that that a single run was was larger than the amount of time uh, to fail, the average time to fail for the one of the computers that, that in the simulation. And we've come a long way, <laughs> I think, since then. But um, but. Uh, Simulations have enormous, enormous uh, impact and, and, and scope and range and where they're being used goes all the way from places that we'll never find out about um, uh, to, to the home uh, or on cell phones <laughs> as, as well. Um, and, and one of the, the key things, I guess, behind all this is, and certainly uh, uh, our chair's um, initial motivation is that dealing with playing games is fun, but not only playing games. But certainly when you're developing games and involved with games, testing games, creating games, that is a very uh, exciting, uh, very fun um, thing to do. It can be a lot of work, uh, certainly without any doubt, uh, but it, it can be very enjoyable. The games themselves incorporate, and Kristen will have a lot more to say about this later on, incorporate a tremendous range of, of um, uh, of skills that one needs to, to deal with games. Um, uh, going in, in a very gross way from looking at art and music, um, sound, um, uh, programming, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and, and, and physics. It's incredible that the number of things that comes that may come into play into, into games, which makes it a wonderful educational, wonderful educational tool. And it's not only the, the number of things that come in, it's how these things stress the software and the hardware uh, that really make it quite compelling for, for students to be learning what's going on at the cutting edge. And, and, and finally, the last motivation was to, uh, be, because of, of this scope in, in gaming, the hope was that we, were, we would be able to bring together a lot of the campus. Um, and, and that has certainly happened. We, we have partners in this, um, in this activity, some of which are, are very closely tied in and some are some others that are, are, are more distant. Um, but we have these ties that are beginning on campus. Uh, certainly the, the, the facility itself will be in the EECS department. Uh, the first course that, that Christian will describe a little bit later on directly involves the English department uh, and, and English majors, the music department and music majors, and the Cleveland Institute of Art with uh, a good number of, of, of art majors as well. The School of Medicine, Nursing, and Dentistry are involved in a peripheral sense. Um, we're involved with, with their simulation facilities. They're involved with ours. And, um, and probably School of Medicine is almost not so peripherally involved as we'll see in just, just a moment. The idea of the, the laboratory then is to, is to enable students and enable faculty to, to learn in a, a very strongly experiential way, not sitting in the classroom listening to a lecture, but down in um, uh, the, the, the facility that we have, the software and the hardware, to, to create games and not learn about artificial intelligence in an abstract way, but to apply it um, uh, to an enemy non-player in, in a game. Um, we want, there's a lot of our courses that 
are exciting because the professor is exciting. There are a lot of our courses, and you could probably name the, the faculty and the courses <laughs> that are not exciting. Um, in fact, that really go on to the, the, uh, the word boring, I think, or dull, would, would, uh, has come up a, a number of times yeah, in discussing some of them. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and keep it clean. Uh, so we want to push to bring gaming into a lot of these courses to really re-energize them. Um, we have, uh, we've developed three new courses, two of which we're offering next year, one the following year, Chris will be talking about, um, that are oriented toward gaming. And finally, while we don't want to have a gaming uh, degree, um, uh, full sale, DigiPet, we, we don't want to have a degree like some other schools uh, may have. We want to have computer engineering, computer science, systems, uh, double E as our main cornerstone degree. We also would like to have a, 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 a or enable students to have a, a concentration in these areas. So this is what we um, came up with. And for the actual physical construction, the kind of coming in, walking along here, and I wish I had a virtual tour at, at this point, but, but I don't. It would fit in very well, but I don't have it. Walking in over here, we have a glass entrance and a little side uh, over here, we're going to have a couple of 24-inch LCD monitors just to kind of give a good high-tech feeling to the lab itself. Uh, the conference room can be used, but let's not really think about that in the, in the lab. We have a virtual reality room that sits over here. I'll talk about some of this stuff in each one of the rooms as we go along. Um, we have an audio room um, that, um, again, I'll talk about. Uh, an immersion room, a single, a single station immersion room here. We have a console, and these are all closed off. Uh, we have a console, console room over here with four stations. And um, each station, you really shouldn't think about it as a single person. Uh, we'll probably have a couple of, couple of chairs, if you will. Uh, the idea of love seats was, uh, was thrown out early on. Um, but a couple of chairs in each position over here, so four of those, keep that in mind. And over here we have um, 18 PCs, um, and here our PC room, and then uh, a small medical simulation room over here. Uh, right now this is Froggy's office, so <laughs> I don't know whether that's going to stay. Um, I have a feeling he's going to be in this audio room an awful, awful lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that also. There's going to be a lot of fighting for this place. Um, uh, and, and I don't know who's going to win. This, the laboratory is set up and it was funded to be an undergraduate laboratory, um, specifically. Um, so most of the use will be undergraduates. There will be research projects. Um, my hope is those research projects will help and give tools to undergraduates. Yeah, I know, I know. 24 hour access, um, and, uh, <laughs> Food, drink, particularly drink, uh, allowed. This is not a picture of the lab. The lab, obviously, would be in construction. But this is as close as I can find um, to what uh, we hope that it's going to look like. And, um, uh, and people working independently, people are clearly working uh, together. So our PC room, uh, the PCs will be as, as hot as we can get them, literally. Uh, probably Dell XPS gaming systems, 24-inch LCD monitors on each, um, and the hottest graphics cards that we can get, short of being externally water-cooled, I think, is really what we're aiming for. Um, and, as we, and as we move ahead, certainly that will be the one area that will require, I think, the most funds in keeping up to, up to date. So we have 18 PCs in, in that room. Um, Yes, uh, the air conditioner actually um, kind of kicked me in the rear uh, in the sense that we don't have, we have air conditioning now, but we need to boost it up. Uh, and that air conditioning unit alone will probably run in order about $40,000. So it's a five ton unit. They wanted to put it up on the top of the ceiling tiles, and I said, no, I, this is going up on the roof. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with it for two reasons. One, the sound. And the second time, the second reason is last time that we, we did that, uh, it was leaking in the room in the 131 room and actually started a fire, electrical fire. So I went far away. So that, that cost a lot of money, which did my $375,000, by the way. That comes out of the general. Actually, we're, we're looking to name the lab, so we're looking at sponsors. Um, but, but we'll get that. 
um, the console room. The console room will have those four console stations, uh, Xboxes, PS2s, um, probably the new dinner ones, um, uh, and hopefully whenever Xbox 3, Xbox 360 comes out, whatever it is, PS3 comes out, we'll certainly have the, the latest and greatest in there. The basic idea will be that each station will have above it uh, a DLP uh, front projection unit. So the actual projection size on the screen across, um, across the, uh, the room will be on the order of seven, eight feet. So each one will have a seven feet screen uh, ahead of it, fairly close. So it'll be a fairly strong experience and each one will have a sound system associated with it. Um, that should be a wild room. <laughs> the laboratory facilities in general will have, we wanna be able to explore games on, on portable devices so um, uh, iPad, uh, um, certainly uh, Nintendo DS, and when we get our hands on uh, PSP, uh, we'll certainly have probably about two of each you know, for students to take and, and, to, and to use. The virtual reality room will have a number of components in there, a lot of, a lot of fun things. Um, and we'll have a couple of uh, uh, head-mounted displays, um, 800, true 800 by 600 resolution um, and stereoscopic uh, capability. So 800 by 600 in each RGB uh, channel. So uh, pretty good the display. Um, we'll have three haptic interfaces, um, two objects which are, they're about a grand a piece and they're, I wouldn't call them game quality. They're a little bit better than game quality, but they, they're not for sophisticated use for somebody who is simulating a surgical situation. Uh, this is a little bit more a fancy one. And, and it, all of the, the Omni ones and the desktop unit, um, this runs probably about uh, almost 10 times uh, the cost of, of these. So it's more sophisticated. The main thing is the res higher resolution and also the, the amount of force that, that can be delivered back to somebody using it. So we're gonna have two uh, low-cost gaming ones, so somebody can have a left and a right hand one, and move it all around, and, it's, and both of them are six degree of freedom. So you can move it all around here and, and rotate in terms of the angles uh, as well. So we'll have three haptic interfaces. We'll have uh, three tracking devices. One, magnetic tracker, which is actually the Polemus uh, Liberty, but not with the, the long range thing. It's, it's for this room, so we don't need a major thing at, at, at 20, 30 feet, whatever it is. Um, so we'll have one magnetic tracker, um, which will have six degree of freedom. Uh, so you can put it on a wrist and see where that wrist is going and how that wrist is rotating. We'll have two inertial trackers you can put on a head, uh, and that's three degree of freedom and, and move around. This thing is, is much more expensive than this. Um, but we, we then have the capability of someone moving around a room um, and rotating things uh, in hands and so on. And these both require uh, a tether, that's correct, yeah. Um, we'll have three data gloves, two um, less expensive data gloves that have five joints, uh, basically uh, these joints, um, and a left and right, and they both look the same, and one right-handed one, even though I'm left-handed, I, I went along and uh, went in with this, uh, one 14 uh, joint glove as well. And again, there's considerable difference in price. These we're looking at more in the gaming sense. This we're looking more in the more high fidelity simulation sense. So we'll have uh, these as well, basically to play with and, and to develop projects with and so on. And I, this is the best slide that I could find, picture that I could find. It kind of brings all these things together in terms of the virtual reality room. Uh, head mounted display, a couple of data gloves, I think. <laughs> Um, trackers, basically you can view these things as haptic interfaces. Uh, uh, although ours will be much much smaller in, uh, than this. In addition, in the virtual reality room, I have a couple of graduate students right now that are making another input device that allows you, again, all these things basically allow you to, to create input that, uh, that, that, that allow you to deal with a virtual world that you're seeing and, and or hearing. Uh, we also have, I have two graduate students that are working on a three-dimensional treadmill that will allow someone to walk around in, in, in the world that they create. And it's, it's a cool device. We've seen some other ones before that are 
bizarre uh, that essentially have a treadmill and another independent treadmill and another independent treadmill that go around in like a Taurus configuration. And you walk in this way in one way, and then you walk in this one, and, you, and these things rotate in. Ours is going to be considerably simpler. That was the Army. <laughs> the Army built that one. Uh, and it probably weighs a couple of tons. But we're, we're building another one that allows someone to walk off, you know, left and right and walk around in a virtual world and, um, and also have it being raised. So if someone wanted to walk around San Francisco, um, they can just walk around and just see what's going on and feel that, that elevation change. So that's our VR room. Our immersion room, um, this is the best I can find. It's a single station, uh, probably pretty comfortable chair. Uh, we'll have uh, one uh, projection, front projection device, and that will uh, likely be a Barco. It's a 3D uh, projector. So uh, the students will be able to, to do 2D, they'll be able to do 3D, um, and, and be in this kind of office-sized room, totally black, uh, good sound system, and, and have a good sense of immersion. We'll have the consoles in here, as well as a high-end uh, PC, so they can use it really for, for both. That room I expect to be used quite a bit <laughs> as well. Um, and the audio room um, will have hardware and software associated with it. The, the hard, this is not actually that far from what it will probably look like. We'll have two uh, PCs in there, and, and we've chosen PCs over Macs. Uh, we originally had one PC, one Mac. All the other uh, computers are going to be PCs. Um, just from a facility point of view, we're choosing two of them. Uh, one really for real-time work, one for uh, production work. Um, we're going to have monitors, uh, essentially surround sound, uh, self-powered surround sound uh, speakers, um, and we'll have three MIDI instruments, so sort of a MIDI band uh, will be in there. We'll have one 88 key uh, um, uh, MIDI keyboard, we'll have one um, uh, MIDI guitar, uh, essentially a Fender uh, Roland Ready uh, Strat and uh, also a ha Roland Hansonic drum which is um, essentially just a, ha a hand drum so that people of, who are either musically trained and know how to deal with a piano or guitar can do it or someone who's not musically trained and just wants to hit around but has some sense of rhythm hopefully will be able to interact and create music and of course we're, the software will probably have we're looking at uh, Reason 3 and Sonar 4 um, uh, right now. Um, and that's our audio room. And that's just an example. Well, let me, I think, turn the, uh, literally turn the mic over <laughs> to Christian. Hello, everybody. I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit from Professor Buckner's deadpan delivery here. Deadpan delivery. Deadpan delivery. <laughs> uh, We've got this fantastic facility that's going to be opening up next fall. And we're trying to figure out, well, OK, Great hardware is great, but unless you do something interesting with it, like some of the projects that Professor Buckner was talking about, nothing will come of it. So we're going to be opening up the lab to people's projects. We're going to be opening up the lab to graduate student research, as he suggested before, with that 3D treadmill and hopefully other stuff in the future. But some of the more interesting stuff that we're going to be doing is classes. We're going to be teaching a series of three new classes, delving into video games and how to make them, how to produce them. Uh, and all other things with them as well. Now, in order to figure out what we're going to be teaching, it's better to just take a look at some games. So I've got a couple of videos here. And try, try to break it down into Let's look at these videos. See all that are going on. We've got one example.
All right, that game came out a little while ago, but you still see a lot of graphics, some incredible sound design in there, some interesting background music, some inter a lot of ambient sounds going on in the background, you know, the ship rumbling in the background. You saw a lot of AI with the enemies taking cover behind crates and, you know, firing back and picking where they were throwing gr their grenades, all that sort of stuff. Just a tentative example of some of the things that can go into video games. There's even a lot more than this. But just take a look at that list. It's pretty long. And it also happens to map almost to one with what we teach in our courses at Case. So we figured, as Professor Buckner described earlier, some of these classes are not the most interesting classes around. So it might be beneficial if we took some of the projects in these courses and mapped them onto the corresponding parts of video games. In other words, we integrate interactive simulation in video games into the projects in some of our courses to help spice it up a little bit more. Hopefully students will be more receptive to something like that. Uh, and also, you know, if you're designing a network library for use in games, you've got some very interesting additional considerations uh, to, uh, to look at. If you're designing graphics for games, you've got some additional considerations. Uh, it'll really help people get a uh, bigger perspective of all the issues at hand. Aside from just adding projects to our existing courses, we're going to be offering three new courses, as I mentioned before. The first, which is tentatively titled ESIS 290, is Introduction to Game Design and Game Implementation. This is our sophomore level course where students will learn the basics of design and programming. It essentially gives, as you can read, a mile high overview of the basic issues involved in game development. We're going to cover all those topics that you saw in the previous slide in light detail. We're not going to take the students and throw, tie weights to them and throw them into the deep lake that is game programming. So we're going to cover deep basic math, some graphics, some simple sound, uh, basic AI techniques more often than not, state machines, data structures, simulation issues. And we're also going to allow the students to fool around in the lab uh, and try to create their own small projects and see what they come up with. Again, we're going to give them, excuse me, we're going to give them some of the resources that are available in the lab including some pre-built game engines, some pre-built game SDKs, so they don't have to worry about all the implementation issues of, the, of this stuff themselves. They just need to worry about learning how to use it. The next course in the series, delve into the more advanced issues of game development. We're talking about spatial data structures, shaders, and some of the more advanced graphics things you can do on recent hardware, anima animation, code optimization, fancy AI techniques, large-scale software design, because games can get very, very long. And all topics will uh, be integrated into some of the more advanced projects that we're going to have students doing. Again, these are not quite on the scale of full game, but they're going to be very large projects that the students can really sink their teeth into and see how these issues at hand really come into play. Literally, this is a game we're talking about after all. And perhaps the most exciting course that we have is 396L, tentative title right now because it's a special topics course. This is going to be our advanced game project course. This is the class that Professor Buckner referred to earlier where we have everybody involved in it. We have ESIS students doing the programming. We have in, uh, students from the Cleveland Institute of Art working on a corresponding course at the same time who are going to be integrated together into teams and the students will be challenged to complete an entire game all the way to box and manual in one semester. A nearly impossible task if they don't pick their scope properly, but we'll, we'll see what happens with this. This is actually going to be offered in the fall. It's going to debut alongside the lab and Professor Buckner is one of the people who's going to be teaching it. It should be interesting. We also have a couple of music majors in there who want to design, uh, do music design, do score design. Uh, we also have a couple of English majors in there who want to write. They want to do game dialogue. They want to do game story. There's a whole bunch of different aspects of the university that we're trying to tie together with this. Uh, one interesting aspect of this is it's going to be mostly lecture free. Obviously, we need to teach our ESU students the basics. They'll need to know 3D math. They'll need to know basic graphics. But we're going to give most to that. We're going to give them pre-built engines. We're going to give them all the resources the lab has to offer and see how they can build on top of that. After all, if you're going to be creating your own engine, that's a multi-semester project right there on its own. Forget making a game on top of it. Oh, uh, well, we've got several, several engines to choose from. Uh, but the one that we're currently thinking of using is Torque, right? Yeah, or the Half-Life 2 engine. We've, been mani uh, we've managed to secure some licensing deals to use the Source engine, which powered the multi-million dollar hit 
Half-Life 2, which was released last November, and is currently one of the best PC games in, in memory. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting resources that are going to be available to these students. Some of the more esoteric hardware, like the, all that virtual reality hardware that students really wouldn't have the opportunity to use unless the university provided it for them. We're going to hopefully give, uh, make this lab fertile breeding ground for creative projects, game projects, and who knows, maybe even startups in the future. We're very excited to see what's going to come out of this. Anyway, I believe that's it. We have the question slide. I'll turn it back over to Professor Buckner. Well, you can answer questions. Oh, can I answer questions? Sure. Do we have any questions? <laughs> it depends. Uh, that depends on a lot of factors. For example, if Microsoft were to, you know, provide some financial support for the lab, they might not take very well if we ended up modding their Xboxes. But we have they're completely capable of doing that. So far, we're completely independent of any game mm -hmm. developer, game console, software developer. So yeah, didn't didn't they offer you a sign your life away contract and you <laughs> turned it down? <laughs> We've been, we've been very steadfast about that. We're not any one company because we want students to have access to all of it. You can't just look at one subset of it. Question? And let me add, so in particular, one aspect, one small aspect of it, but important, um, is we're not linking into DirectX only. You know, we'll talk DirectX, OpenGL, and, and give our students experience. There is tons of software that needs to be mastered as well, and we didn't go into as much detail about that, but we do have lots of software which is going to be used in this lab. Aside from the obvious, the development tools, Microsoft Visual Studio, all the basics there, um, we are going to have artistic tools. Uh, we're working with an animation company called Natural Motion, which has this fantastic animation software called Endorphin which has been very popular in games. We're going to have licenses of Maya there. Yeah, right, right. yeah we're going to have Maya necessary software. Uh, unfortunately, there's no programming side that you can give people. We're going to for as in an X2 dev kit and game. Uh, but won't be a fall. We're, we're trying to get the word out. And in getting the word out, we're, we're, we're finding partners that we didn't know that we, or think about that, that we would have. Um, we've done an NPR show. Uh, we were on um, uh, Wall Street Journal online, uh, which I gave a nice interview in. And Christian really turned out to be the star of that, that article. Um, but just the other day, uh, uh, there was someone from the uh, uh, Mayor Campbell's uh, administration in the city of Cleveland and wanted to talk about what kind of gaming possibilities that they could leverage off of with the laboratory in the city of Cleveland. So we started a dialogue and um, it looks like there's, they're very interested in exploring how Cleveland can, can get in touch with the gaming community and even though things are on both coasts uh, now how to bring some startups how to bring some excitement how to bring some events to to, to Cleveland and um, this is good this is where all these things start happening and then the the contacts with the companies come as a result of that Yeah, thus far we, we, we are not, we haven't been. Um, we've been concentrating on the construction of the laboratory and its, and its debut with courses in, in, in the curriculum. 
And now that it's becoming closer and closer to being something that you can go in and you can sit down and do something with, we're going to start turning your attention to that. So it's a good point. Uh, sorry for misinterpreting your question. Um, there, we do actually have some contacts, or more specifically, the Cleveland Institute of Art does. Uh, they're in big contact with electronic arts. Uh, EA is hoovering up their graduates as fast as they can, as they can give them out. Uh, it's unfortunate that all of them are going to EA, but that's just currently the way it is. Uh, and also, the Game Developers Conference was last about this time last month. Uh, and I went there and started trying to spread the word about this. Uh, unfortunately, when I said I was from Cleveland, everybody kind of looked at me funny and said, where's that? Well, as far as the game development industry is concerned. So right now, we're really working on the recognition problem before anybody will get, give us the time of day. Oh. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in two ways. Uh, probably even more. Um, one is this, the medical simulation room that we have. There we have a couple of faculty, uh, Vincenzo Libertor and uh, Chen Cavasulu, who are, are looking at surgical simulation, and in particular remote distributed surgical uh, simulation. So we have a small laboratory that's going to address that. Uh, I'm also on the board, uh, not really a board, I wouldn't call it, advisory group, uh, and, and closely linked in with another simulation center uh, for the School of Medicine. And the School of Medicine is putting together, it's about an eight, 9,000 square foot uh, facility. Um, and they call some of what they're doing low tech simulation. And what that means is I'm the doctor and you're the patient, <laughs> basically. But that simulation is important for their, for their, their students. Um, so a significant amount of uh, effort is going into that and also uh, also into the audiovisual and, and digital recording of, of that. Uh, but they also have other aspects of simulation in terms of simulating um, uh, other encounters and uh, simulating laparoscopies, uh, emergency situations. Um, and there's, uh, there'll be an ER room, an OR room, um, and um, another large simulation room with, with mannequins. Um, and, and the level of simulation fidelity is, is, is good. It, it's, it's very interesting what, what, they, what they actually simulate uh, in, in some of these situations. Those from looking at a, a mannequin and simulating um, uh, EKGs to uh, uh, oxygen in the blood, pulse, to the patient having to roll over and throw up because you have administered the wrong drug. Um, and so there's a lot of cool things that are going on in there. And, and they not only want to have um, pre-bought packages, but they want to be able to um, enhance some of the things in, in ways that uh, haven't been imagined. So the tie-in with engineering and computer engineering and science is very important to them. So there, there's a lot of going back and, back and forth. Anything else? Yeah. Is that whirlwind or world? World wind? Okay. Mm-hmm. What NASA location? Do you know the NASA location that's most involved with that? At Ames? Okay. Yeah. project course next semester. I'm going to be working on a project over the summer, just as something, something to get this kicked off. Thank you. And we're hoping that the, uh, that the students next semester 
will have a lot of fun with their projects and we'll get a lot of good good products that we can you know like you said put the case name on make them up on a website that and start pointing industry resources toward uh, industry people towards it and we can then show them you know once we've got something actually to show them besides just the lab uh, that just the lab just besides the just lab? <laughs> You know, yeah. like like I said before, we can have all the greatest hardware in the world, but unless we do interesting things with it, nobody's going to be interested. Uh, so, when, uh, once that first semester pushes through, and once we see what these students students are capable of, we'll really we'll really be able to impress people a lot more. Was there another question over there? Right. Uh huh. Um, the the games because of uh, uh, the fact that they're going to be using engines that um, are, are not for commercial use, either the Half Life Two engine or the licenses that we'll have for the Torque engine, uh, they can't be sold. So the in, in effect, um, there's nothing you can do with that intellectual property. And what? Um, I would think that we can give it away as long as it's intended not to be reused for commercial commercial purposes. Yeah. And in fact, I would even say maybe we can get you involved in testing to make sure that the game winds up being you know as good a game as it can be. Uh, somebody somebody suggested. Okay, I know I got to finish up here. Someone suggested that, and I've had a lot of questions on the part of the students. I wouldn't have thought to ask this question, but the question that several students in, in asking about the course said, what is the grading policy going to be? And um, my response was, someone mentioned, and I said, half in jest, that we're going to measure it based on the addictive power of the games. We're going to give it to somebody for a weekend, and then at the end of the week, we'll say, how many hours did you spend on it? And, and that will form your, your major portion for your grade. So it's cool. Does it work, and is it fun? Does Chris have a question? We have, even with everything that we're purchasing here, number one, there, there's funds that are left over. And, and I'll use those as a few, for a few years in any event to kind of you know, get the latest and greatest what I can get my hands on. Um, the development office is going out for looking for funding for, for the laboratory, for the physical construction, and also for additional funds in terms of the use uh, that as time goes on. Um, right now, there are no fixed uh, sources for ongoing revenues uh, to continue, you know, revitalizing the, the lab. But that will have to be a major priority. I've seen too many labs that have started out in a bang um, and just fizzled away as time has, has gone by. So we'll need to address that. Like, That's a good point. Like Professor brought up, uh, Buckner brought up earlier, though. The mayor's office themselves are interested in this. We're hoping there's going to be enough interest in this lab and hopefully enough good student projects coming out of it and other good things that it will maintain enough interest for future future capital to come into it. When you, uh, when you get rid of things, they go to the like, university salvage. Can you email me the day before they have? <laughs> <laughs> when we get rid of the computers, they'll still probably be pretty beefy. I so, have yeah. uh, specifically the, the polyamus tracker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's, We're anxious to get our hands on it, yeah, too. It hasn't come in yet. It's been ordered. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun, finally having access to these, these resources that we just simply wouldn't otherwise. Big, fast computers, inertial trackers, three-dimensional projectors. And I know I'm going to be going crazy. I hope the other students will, too. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thank you.